Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Katarina Mellström and I'm the Secretary General of Global Child Forum. And today we are broadcasting from our office here in Stockholm. Together with my colleagues, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar about our latest sector-focused benchmark report, Food, Beverage and Personal Care. This benchmark, as you will soon hear, takes a 360 degrees look at this industry's approach to children's rights. Global Child Forum was founded by the Swedish royal family over a decade ago to bring together thought leaders and influencers from business, civil society, academia and government to spur actions for social change around children's rights. We focus on the power of business to be the driver of change, and we encourage businesses to take actions in their operations that best advance children's rights. So today we are focusing on you. As you already know, the food, beverage and personal care sector has an enormous impact on children's rights and well-being. And while we are often bombarded with news about the risk this sector poses to children, there are also many opportunities for businesses to grow by developing new products and services with children's best interests in mind. Today, we will hear about companies integrating a children's, children's rights approach in many aspects of their work. They are industry leaders and show what's possible when children's rights are integrated into the entirety of business operations. At Global Child Forum, we believe in collaborations and that many challenges can best be handled together with others and that we can learn from each other. And today's webinar allows you to do that precisely. Today, we will listen to our senior children's right and business specialist, Nina Folmer, Andreas Lundmark, managing director and partner at Boston Consulting Group, and Sean Ushia, Corporate Engagement Manager at Global Child Forum. And before I pass over to Nina, I wanted to encourage you to submit questions and comments in the chat function. And at the end of the session, we will do our best to address these questions. So with that, thank you very much. And you are so welcome. Now I hand over to you, Nina. Thank you, Katerina. And I'm trying to share my screen here while speaking. It's always a challenge. I think there we go. So really happy today to be here to present the results from our latest benchmark on the food, beverage and personal care sector that we produced in collaboration with Boston Consulting Group. Today, we will talk about firstly the benchmark and how we do it, then take a bit of a look on the overall results uh, secondly, deep dive into two of the key takeaways from the analysis, and then finally look at some recommended actions. And then we'll get a bit of a commentary from Andreas at Boston Consulting Group at the end. So the food, beverage and personal care benchmark consists of 310 companies, and we choose the companies that we benchmark from the World Benchmarking Alliance's SDG 2000 list. And this list is, consists of the companies that the World Benchmarking Alliance um, considers to be the most important to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. From the list, we have taken companies from the industries, agricultural products and services, retail, food and beverage, and personal and household products. All in all, these companies represent six regions and 42 countries. How do we do our benchmark then? What do we base it on? So 
Our methodology is something we have been developing over a long time, and it not only helps us to assess companies and the reporting, but it also can serve as a roadmap for companies looking to identify gaps and opportunities to improve in their own reporting. The methodology is based on the children's rights and business principles, which were developed by the UN Global Compact, Save the Children and UNICEF about 10 years ago. And they are in turn based on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which guidance, gives guidance on how to perform due diligence. So we are sort of relating to both of those frameworks. In the methodology, we also make reference to relevant GRI standards uh, for individual indicators. And we're also now looking at doing the same for the upcoming European reporting standards when they are decided upon, hopefully, this summer. Um, we do the assessment or our methodology uh, looks at issues across the full spectrum of children's lives uh, and how, where they interact with business. So we look at, for example, child labor and working conditions for young people and parents. We look at marketing and products and services uh, as well as the environment and children in the community. For clarification, when we speak of a child, we use the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child definition. So it's any person under the age of 18. So when we say child, we actually mean both children and teenagers as they are usually understood. We assess companies' publicly available information and we do that across 25 indicators. Trying to see if I can, yeah, there. Uh, we score the information that we find as either a zero, which means we haven't found any information at all relating to this topic, as a five, which means that we found information relating to the topic, but on human rights with sustainability generally, and not mentioning children. Or as a 10, which means we found information on the topic with specific mention of children. Uh, I should also say that we do the assessment and do a preliminary scoring, which we send out to companies before publishing the results on our website uh, to make sure that we haven't missed any relevant information. Uh, our 25 indicators are grouped into four impact areas. And the first one is governance and collaboration. Here we look at how children's rights are being addressed overall. So are there references to relevant frameworks in the international standards? Is there involvement from the highest level of management? And is the company collaborating with others, NGOs or peers? Uh, in the workplace area, we look at child labor, working conditions for legally working young workers, and parents' working conditions. In the marketplace, we look at responsible marketing, labeling, as well as responsibility when it comes to products and services. And finally, under community and environment, we look at the indirect impacts. So what is the impact on children in terms of the environment they live in or the community? So this could be, for example, the use of pesticides in agricultural production or the impacts from uh, production plants or operations in terms of logistics or the use of space where children are also present. Across all these impact areas, we look at three levels of reporting. So first we look at policies and commitments. So what is a company saying that they want to do in terms of reducing negative impacts and uh, increasing positive impacts? Then we look at what is being said around implementation and process. So basically, how are the commitments being translated into action in the company? And finally, we look at reporting and actions, which is, is there transparent reporting on the outcomes and the effects of these policies and commitments? And here we look, for example, at reporting around identified risks, if there are incidents of non-compliance, but also looking at actions taken, so prevention, remediation, or support to children. 
If we then, oh, we've got a bit of a sneak peek there. If we then look at the results, which might be more interesting, uh, the results of the overall scoring uh, is that we have an average score for all companies at 4.4 out of 10. Um, we would consider this to be quite low, not in relation to other sectors, which score at approximately the same, but more given that our assessment actually looks at the minimum requirements of what we expect company to report on. And getting an average of 4.4 out of 10 then is not super impressive. If we look at the industry results, we can see that there's a bit of a spread between the industries in included. So we have personal and household products in the top at 6.0. Um, it's also the smallest industry, so it doesn't really affect the uh, sector average that much. Then we have retail at 4.9, agriculture products and services as 4.2, and food and beverage, the largest industry at 4.0. I should also say that even though we assess all companies across industries on the exact same indicators, the overall results are weighted. So the, these scores actually reflect how well the companies in the industry report on the issues that matter the most. So for example, product safety and marketing or the marketplace is weighted quite low for the agriculture products and services as they are not consumer facing but weighted higher for food and beverage, for example. And more information about the industry results, risks and analysis, and a lot of more uh, top lists and interesting uh, analysis can be found in the industry scorecards on the report website. And the link to the report will be shared at the end of this. But if we then look at the more individual and the overalls, then the overall scores, we can take a look at the top 10 scoring companies overall. And here we see, and I should say before going into this also that a disclaimer is that we assess companies own reporting here. We're not looking at outcomes or effect. And we're also looking at the best that the company is reporting on. So it's not an overall assessment on everything they do. But we can see in this top list that all industries in the uh, among the companies are represented. So we have Wilmar and Olam from agricultural uh, products and services. We have Santori, Ferrero, Kellogg's, Hershey, and Nestle from uh, food and bath. Record Ben Kaiser and Unilever from personal care and household products, and Aldi North from retail. So it's a nice mix here. And you can also find a few case studies on some of these high scorers to understand more about what they have done to achieve their high scores on the report page. If we then go into a few of the key takeaways, and we have more which can be found in the key takeaway report, but we'll focus on two of them here. Uh, the first one is around the workplace and the scores that we see there. So the workplace, if you remember, focuses on child labor and decent working conditions. And here we can see that the average score for all companies included at 4.9 is slightly higher than the overall score, which basically means that this is an area where companies are scoring slightly better. And um, what we see, however, when we dive into what's behind this number, is that we have 77% of the companies included report they have a policy on child labor, which isn't too bad. However, when we look at sort of the whole transparency cycle, we see that when it comes to reporting on the outcomes, if there are risks or incidents or what you know about what is going on with child labor in your operations and supply chain, only 25% of the companies report on this. And equally, only 23% report on what they're doing about it. So if there are remediation or prevention actions going on. And this gap between saying what you want to do and what your aspirations are, and then what you actually report on has happened, is what we call the transparency gap. 
And basically what this does is put it, put into doubt a little bit the uh, solidity of the due diligence processes in these com- in the companies who don't report on the outcomes. And uh, we, we don't know really the credibility of these claims that you want to work against child labor. We also see that 64% of all the companies included actually are not reporting on outcomes when it comes to human rights overall. And this connected to due diligence and, for example, upcoming legislations or newly accepted legislations around due diligence all over the world, this can be problematic. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Let's see if I can switch slides here. My computer doesn't want there. The other key takeaway that we wanted to bring up today is around the marketplace score. So that is on the market responsible marketing, as well as uh, products and services that support and protect children. And if we look at the overall score here at 2.7, that's quite a bit lower. So this is the area where most companies are scoring lower overall. And if we then deep dive a little bit into the background of that, and I should say here also that we, for these numbers, we have excluded agricultural products and services as they're not consumer facing, but 22% of all the companies in the remaining industries say they have a responsible policy on marketing when it comes to children. Uh, But only 10% highlight marketing, responsible marketing or uh, product responsibility, for example, as a material issue, including children under that umbrella. And only 8% of the companies have a policy that talks about product or service responsibility and how children are included in that. So overall, these quite low numbers show us that children are often overlooked as a specific stakeholder group when it comes to these topics. And this can be problematic for two reasons. One is that children are a more vulnerable group that needs protection and who is affected quite differently than adults, both when it comes to products and marketing. But also because children and teenagers are a huge consumer group and overlooking their needs and sort of what they want or protecting them is a lost market opportunity. But there are also companies who are doing things and I'd like to just highlight a few of them. And again, uh, for Unilever and PepsiCo, we have uh, cases on our web that you can read more about this. But so, for example, something that can be done is around reformulation and product development. And we have the example here of Unilever who have made the commitment that all the products that they have who are uh, catering for children should adhere to the highest nutrition standards. So these are own standards that they have developed in terms of nutritional value and is especially looking at uh, foods that are high in fat, salts and sugars. Uh, We also have PepsiCo who looks at responsible marketing and have made some efforts there together with many others, I should say. So this is one example. Uh, where the company has sort of taken global policies across all markets and legislations to create a sort of level playing field for the company when it comes to marketing and have based these policies on WHO standards as well as industry standards. So they're, for example, a signatory to the International Food and Beverage Alliance's global marketing policy. This is also a good example of how you can work with others and your peers to raise the standards uh, on these topics and not having to do it yourself. And finally, we have L'Oreal who has taken an ethical approach to how they um, do marketing and products in relation to children. So in L'Oreal's code of ethics, we can find a specific section on responsible marketing where they're highlighting, for example, the need to have an ethical approach to using children as models in the marketing and how you can think about that, something that's often overlooked. But also to 
let children be children and have a think about how you relate to children when it comes to beauty products, uh, beauty ideals and cosmetics, um, which is the main business of L'Oreal. So finally then, if we sum up two key takeaways from this is that one is we see a lack of transparency regarding outcomes and compliance. And that is with own policies. The second is that we see that children are largely overlooked by companies when it comes to marketing and products. And we do think that this is a lost opportunity. But there are things we can do and we can all become children's rights champions. So firstly, we would like to see a closing of this reporting gap. Don't only report on what you want to do, but also uh, be transparent about how that works in reality and uh, know your impacts and, and report on them. That means shows that you're also truly committed to uh, improving children's lives. The secondly is that you can unlock the potential in supporting children. So don't think of it only as doing good for doing good's sake, but it's actually making good business sense to look at supporting children's rights and health and well-being. And finally, overall, by recognizing that children are stakeholders to business across a range of areas is actually recognizing that the sector has a role to play in supporting children and that children impact business in turn. And now I will leave it to our partner, Andreas. Thank you, Nina. Um, yeah, so uh, I think this is a very interesting um, highlights and, and, and takeaways from the report. And, and, and BCD has been a part of supporting Global Child Forum since 2013. Um, and I think we, we have together benchmarked over 3,000 companies, both regionally and globally. And I think we now can start also um, sort of harvest a bit of that work in terms of being able to follow how this develops over time, which I also think is is very interesting. Um, uh, and with the purpose of in increasing understanding and driving action. Um, what is surprising is that uh, from this, from this, and, and a bit disappointing, I would say, is that child labor is sort of still um that of the focal point of, of many companies um and so the the scope of, of uh, activities and, and target setting could be much broader um 22 percent of, of companies having a policy for responsible marketing especially when it comes to marketing heavy companies is is not impressive at all i, I agree so uh, but we also what we have seen is that uh, children's rights and, and activities around that have become a more integral part of, of the overall sustainability work and the how you strive to, to, to achieve the SDGs. Uh, and I hope it will become an articulated part of ESG and the ESG reporting that is, is now coming a, a, around the corner. Um, we can we also see, I think, a bit more of, of turning the risk averse into an opportunity with the, with the best ones actually seeing it as an opportunity, both how you think about uh, children as stakeholders holistically in everything from, from product development uh, and sort of how you interact with, with children to, to how, how um, children are, are impacted by, by secondary effects, which I think is, is sort of the, the most mature ones are, are, are displaying fairly well. And I, I, one personal takeaway is also when we've done those global and, and local, global or regional uh, studies is that sometimes it's very hard for a global company to to have something that sort of works and also follow up what actually happens. Whereas I think if you are a local champion, uh, I remember we did uh, we did in, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa where some of the local champions found it so natural to take on a lot of lots of those questions because they lived in that context, so they also close by. Whereas if you're a local, global company, it comes with a bit of a challenge, both in terms of how you drive action and follow up. Uh, what I hope lies ahead is um, a much more widening of the scope of activities and the way you look at children's rights in relation to business. I hope that the leaders will mature even more and that the leading industries will inspire and, and, and pull along the, the, the laggard industries and because we can see there's still a, a big spread with the, between 
industries and sectors, um, which I had hoped to be smaller after after 10 years in this. Um, and uh, I can also see, we can also see a slight um, a slight uh, link between uh, that well-run companies, companies that grow and make profit, typically also are better at at at, uh, at the children's rights. So I think there's a link there as well. Um, yeah, um, that was a short commentary. I, I look forward to the discussion after us, but I hand, hand over to Sean now. Thank you, Andreas. My name is Sean O'Shea. I'm the Corporate Engagement Manager here at the Global Child Forum. Put simply, I'm your point of contact. I'm here to help answer your questions and make sure you're aware of the great products and services that we offer, and also to make sure you know exactly what's going on with the benchmark. A start here, the Children's Rights and Business Workbook is a go-to guide on how to integrate children's rights into your operation. It's free. There's no annoying subscriptions. You don't have to tell us your mother's maiden name or your pet's favorite color. You just log on to the website and you can find it available for download. This treasure trove of help is the ideal starting point, whether you're just beginning to think about this issue or you're looking where to go next after a great score in the 2022 benchmark. It contains advice, guidance, checklists, templates. The link should appear in the chat, so you don't even have to Google for it. Next, communicate your score. Companies that communicate transparently gain consumer and investor trust, and they grow brand loyalty. Sharing your score and initiatives is not just good PR. Your peers can also learn from the great work that you've been doing. On our website, you'll find a toolkit with templates, messages, and graphics. And if you need any more help, we have a team ready and willing to help you. That brings me to my final point. Engage with us. Your feedback during the benchmark process ensures that the scores are correct. As Nina said, together we can all become children's rights champions. Reach out to me and I'd be happy to meet and explain our benchmark or services, or even listen to your ideas about how we can help you further. We now have a question and answer session. You can ask a question in the chat still, and someone will make sure that I see it. We've received a few by email and some in the chat, so I'm going to try and combine them together. So we start off with this one. Um, great research. If possible, can you please elaborate a bit on if how you measure the extent to which companies have implemented effective child labor remediation processes in their supply chains and b report on the number of child labor cases remediated in their supply chain? and the resources allocated to this. And we actually got another child labor question, so I'm gonna couple them together. Why are some of the highest scoring companies some of those that are known to have child labor issues? Perhaps Nina, you could start on this. Sure, thanks, Sean. And, and thanks for great questions. Um, I think, first of all, and as I said at some point, um, we are looking at the basics of what we would expect a company to report on. So some of these sort of um, more detailed questions about what is good remediation or good prevention is unfortunately a little bit beyond the scope of the benchmark, um, even though we do give some guidance on it in terms of our cases and, and other ways of sort of following what companies have been doing. Uh, there are other benchmarks, though, that take a much closer look at this. So, for example, the corporate and human rights benchmark um, and a few of the other World Benchmarking Alliance's sector-specific benchmarks uh, can be looked at for if you want more specific information on a company and if they if they come further than, than what we're trying to, to capture. Um, one of the challenges for us is that we look at all sectors, which means there are limits to how, how deep we can go in terms of, of the measuring of this. Um, and when it comes to the the companies that have been involved in child labor and also receiving a high score, there is a quite natural connection there, I would say. Um, so one of them is that we know that child labor exists in the world and having a policy that says you don't accept child labor doesn't mean child labor goes away. Um, so most of the large companies, especially if you're in um, critical sort of supply chains where you're working with minerals uh, or agriculture, we know that somewhere child labor will probably be present. So it's actually more about understanding 
where it is a problem and how you can work with that and um, then have, having none of it. So some of the highest scoring companies are the ones who are actually being transparent about it and uh, not saying that they don't have any issues. That's not what we're saying. Uh, what we're saying is they're at least talking about it. I think a few of the companies that are lower scoring might have exactly the same problems, uh, but they're just not talking about it in the same way. And it might be because you have been sort of in the public eye and spotlight with scandals or a crisis where you have felt the need to speak more about this, but that's sort of the pattern that we see. I, I would also add to that, we have a few uh, past benchmarks from companies uh, that we know have been sort of in, in, in the very, very public um, cases where, where child labor or other things have been exposed, and that typically is a call to action to really start taking this seriously. Um, uh, and, and sort of take a more holistic approach to it. So I don't think we have the score before and after, but 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 uh, from the case studies we've done, it's very apparent that those companies have sort of been uh, wise in hide, hindsight, you may may know for, but that has really been a contrast, and then they have stepped up their game significantly and also been very open. Many of them have been very open sharing their experiences with others. Great. Uh, we have another question now. We have to go through human rights benchmarks, environmental benchmarks and slews of other third party assessments. The question is, what is the added value of actually looking at our work from a children's rights perspective over and beyond children's rights? Nina, if you'd like to. Yeah, I think this is the um, sort of we we are very well aware of sort of all of the different types of um, measurings and indices and um, things that you have to sort of engage with nowadays. Um, one of the things we do, and we try to align with others, so it's not like we are re requiring any company to report according to the way that we uh, set up our benchmark. We follow sort of, as I said in the beginning, the structures for due diligence and try and look for that type of reporting. Um, we also look at the GRI standards, for example, and align with other benchmarks as well to make sure that we capture what companies are reporting, not sort of requiring companies to report differently depending on what we are looking for. What I think is the sort of the added value of looking at children's rights when it comes to this is that um, children are small humans. <laughs> so any human right also applies to children, except for perhaps voting or marrying. Um, so if you consider children's rights as a start rather than as an afterthought, you have most probably covered all human rights as well uh, to a large extent. And so it's actually an efficiency argument, I would say, to um, if you forget children, you will probably have forgotten something that is relevant also to other stakeholder groups. I, th I just think that it adds a, 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 another dimension to think from from um, sort of from the perspective of, of of children in the way you look at things from from. Uh, what you do and how you do things, how you interact with with uh, with the society. So I think it's value adding for that sake. Um, and um, I do think that uh, that this benchmark and, and has been putting the finger on some things that are maybe overlooked if you if you if you sort of if you handle it as as just one of many CSR questions. Uh, I think that um, that, that sort of labor is the typical one I think by expanding the the way you look look at this but just the sort of the the, the full scope the 360 view I think uncovers a lot of things that you maybe wouldn't have uh, thought about before so hopefully uh, that is that that is what value it adds maybe I can also add mm -hmm. actually because um, children, make up 30% of the world's population. Um, so I, there's nothing you can lose in, in considering children if you want to make sure that your sort of 
uh, covering all bases and understand sort of your impact on, especially when it comes to social impact. And um, overlooking children there, I think, is is not only a risk, but it's also, as I said, around the sort of the marketing and products, it is sort of a lost opportunity. There, it's not only about not having a negative impact, but also like seeing the positive things that you can contribute with and which can then also contribute to your company. Thank you, Nina and Andreas. I think that's a good point to, to end on. Um, these children today that we talk about are tomorrow's consumers. So I think it's also good business sense. Um, you want them there to, to sell to next time. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Nina, Andreas and Katerina and the entire team at Global Child Forum who have uh, put together the benchmark and today's event. Uh, I'm available. Please um, drop me an email if you do have any more questions or you'd like to follow up on any of the points raised and we'll be happy to try and answer them or put you in touch with the right people. And if you want to know more about the benchmark, how your company is involved, or what your company can do to improve its score and its impact on children, just get in touch with us. We really look forward to work working closer with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great day.